first speaker I want to introduce, and I can see she's already waiting, is Liz Parrish. Yeah. <laughs> and Liz is the founder of BioViva and also of the Best Choice Medicine, an initiative to really help patients to get earlier access to medicine that That's might funny. not be otherwise available. But what I'm personally most excited about what you've done now this year is you have created a new company, Generasis, which really That's helps funny. the eyes. Macular degeneration, as far as I understand, glaucoma, all those uh, type of things that you want to help heal with, of course, gene therapy. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and um, for those of uh, you who do not know Liz, Liz has been the first person in the world who has treated herself with, or has been treated for, with gene therapy for aging. First time in 2015 and second time in 2020. And, I mean, look at her, you know, <laughs> it works and it's so valuable. And then when you go a step further and think, okay, um, you know, this is all about gene therapy, which she is. <laughs> but at the same time, she loves digging in in the garden and working with nature because what Liz says, like for many people, they think dichotomy, you know, that's complete opposites, but no. Liz says, this is bringing us back to nature. Gene therapy is bringing us back to nature. So with that, I give you Liz and enjoy her talk. <laughs> Thank you so much. I am so happy to be amongst what I consider my family. This is a really exciting conference. We only get to do it once a year. And I take your energy and I keep it with me the whole rest of the year. You literally energize me and I hope I energize you. So our understanding of the gene has come a long ways. For instance, since Gregory Mendel described inheritance in the 1850s, that is, you get one half of your genes from your father and one half from your mother, to a very fortuitous photo 100 years later that Rosalind Franklin took of the double helix that then the next year won Watson and Crick the Nobel Prize, to Barbara McClintock who found jumping genes, transposons, genes that can move throughout the genome. This is all the groundwork of today's gene therapy. And I want to educate you in this process because a lot of people don't know how far we've come. In as early as the 1960s, researchers hypothesized that we could insert a gene into cells and cure genetic disorders. And in 1984, Boston's Children's Hospital released a paper showing just that. They introduced a gene into a blood-forming stem cell and forever radicalized what we might be able to do next. In the 1990s, clinical trials started. The first children were dosed with gene therapy for a disease called severe combined immune deficiency. The first child who was dosed, a four-year-old, still speaks publicly about gene therapy to this day. But there were some stumbling blocks too. Early delivery methods for gene therapy integrated into the wrong parts of the genome. And in 1999, a young man lost his life because of an immune reaction to the gene therapy delivery method. And clinical trials in gene therapy went quiet. Luckily, during this period of time which these early trials had started, researchers were already working on a new delivery method for gene therapy. It was called the adeno-associated virus, or AAV for short, and it was revolutionizing treatment for upcoming patients. And in the 2010s, we saw gene therapy clinical trials restart in humans. This is a small, little, tenacious delivery vehicle that can only put in a small amount of genetic material, but gene therapy started in the monogenic space. It started in the space of single gene mutations in humans who vastly and desperately need a gene to make their bodies behave as normal. 
In the case of severe combined immune deficiency, they lack one enzyme. You might notice that disease is called boy in the bubble disease. This single enzyme makes it so the common cold can kill these children. But replacing it creates a cure. All of these diseases that you see on this list, cancer has so many um, gene therapy uh, treatment uh, pipelines that I didn't list them all. But all the ones above that, these monogenic disorders, now have a treatment through gene therapy. And these are approved treatments. This is not something that's gonna happen in the future. The US FDA has approved these treatments. And as a matter of fact, they've worked so quickly in the last year that hemophilia A, hemophilia B, and Duchenne's muscular dystrophy have seen approvals just in 2023. Our industry is ever improving. We started by just inserting a single gene and seeing the benefits of this just single gene creating a protein at the cellular level. And like Ines was alluding to, it's a very natural process. This is a process which evolution has taken us through since the beginning of, of organisms. Gene therapy is a natural process by which we change, sometimes through uh, viral integration and sometimes by our environment. And now, not only can we deliver genes to cells, we can modify your cells outside of your body. That's what they're doing with CAR-T therapy and cancer. They're actually taking your immune systems out, these T cells, they're modifying them, they're putting them back in, and then they attack the cancer. So what we can do here is quite unlimited, but of course where we want to go is we want to start treating aging. Aging is a complex disorder, and so it's not going to be a single gene cure. And so we're trying to build now our arsenal to help you live longer through this type of technology. This type of technology is revolutionary. We're talking taking a therapy maybe once in your lifetime or every five or 10 years. These are all uh, targets for gene therapy today in biological aging. My company, BioViva, I'm always so proud of this. I call it my third child. We've come a long ways uh, since the early days in 2015 where we Un, uh, didn't know that we were going to disrupt a whole industry by saying if these gene therapies work, should, we should be taking them. And we are still taking them. <laughs> but what we did is we went back to the drawing board. We work with AAV, which we think is a fantastic delivery method for uh, gene therapy. If you have a single or small amount of genetic material you need to put in. But what we're building now is delivery methods that will put in larger payloads. So I have taken four gene therapies since the company started, but if we just targeted three of the gene therapies that I'm interested in, we want to put those into one delivery method and get them to you in one treatment. One third the dose will save a lot of money, and in our studies, this was redosable. Where we're at right now, where have we come since all of these years? Uh, we just got our response back for our pre-IND for dementia. A lot of people have been following our work there. Thank you. No, it's, it's actually huge. Uh, th these few people know how big that is for a small company to actually get to this stage. So we worked through uh, medical tourism uh, because it can give ethical and moral access and give people dignity who need access to drugs. And we did an investigator-led study in which five patients were dosed with a dual gene therapy intranasally. And based on that, we are streamlining towards clinical trials. So that's news for this conference that I haven't had before. <laughs> Our CMV vector, uh, which I talked about briefly on the last slide, because I know a lot of people are not highly technical here, we're going to try to, uh, we're going to actually apply for a pre-IND for that one uh, for sarcopenia in an aging population. So that's where we're at now. Now, always I try to do one great reveal. Everyone here knows that I am a huge proponent to patient access. I'm a patient myself. I became my company's first patient, and I want to make sure that people live longer and better. And so we work with medical tourism. We cannot give gene therapies. A lot of people reach out to us for that, but we can assess data. 
And we have a, a 30 patient population coming up, but I got to take some of the data of 10 patients and what happened to them after they did gene therapy to lengthen their telomeres. So these are the 20th percentile shortest telomeres, which are really consequential to human health. So you're seeing the first uh, information, uh, re reports coming out on what happened to these patients, and th this, all of this data is almost five years old now. We have to follow these patients for a really long time. So I hope you look forward to that paper coming out. It'll have a lot more data than this. But for these people, we put literally years on their shortest telomeres. And that has an impact on things like infectious disease and all over health. But it's just one gene that we work with. And if you want to learn more about telomerase reverse transcriptase, ask Bill Andrews. <laughs> Everyone knows that's like his super specialty. He's like my, my uh, super superhero there. The second company I'm working on is Genorisis, and we're going after glaucoma as our first uh, candidate. We're working on a gene that actually can regenerate neurons and it will have application for spinal injury and uh, probably neurodegenerative disease as well. But when we think of longevity, we often think of how we look. And actually, being able to look and see how we look is really important. Glaucoma is considered the silent killer of eyesight. 80 million people will go blind from this, and they won't know they have it until generally it's too late. Most drugs that we look at in this space work on interocular pressure, meaning minimizing the pressure that's causing the damage to the nerve. But this is actually already a well-known path, and so what we want to do is regenerate those nerves and keep you from losing your sight. With this, it's also a gene is inserted into a vector delivery method, and then that is, yes, everybody can go, ooh, now is injected into your eye. But these type of interocular injections, into vitriol actually, are done routinely and they take only a matter of minutes. And we hope that people will choose for that rather than losing their eyesight. <sighs> now I've sort of front loaded you with a whole lot of information. But the first thing and that I want you to think of when you think of me, <laughs> is patient advocacy. Because all of the development of these drugs is all very fine, it's all very fancy, and it all is very high tech. But it's really the patients that benefit from these drugs that matter to me. The regulatory system has been very slow to move these type of drugs forward. As a matter of fact, we don't really have any really good candidates for regenerative medicine yet in the system except for drugs that unbeknownst sort of became uh, beneficial in which people are using off-label for longevity, which is great. I am a proponent of a pre-regulatory route. I actually work globally on this. I am engaging four countries right now. And this pre-regulatory route is something I would like to have right here in the United States, giving people the dignity to try new drugs. Did you know that your medicine, once prescribed by your doctor legally, is over 15 years old? Most innovative medicine doesn't get to humans, not because it's not good, not because it doesn't have good data. It's because small companies can't afford to get it to clinical trials. And we ask the private industry, we constantly have our hands out asking them for money to get us there. So what I want to build is a pre-regulatory route that sort of mimics medical tourism. Because medical tourism is over a $400 billion industry, but it only benefits very few people. So with this new and pre-regulatory route, we can actually de-risk the US FDA by giving moral and ethical access with a review board oversight we can get patients treated, and instead of coming to the US FDA with 1,000 mice data, we could actually come with human data. Right now, drug failure in the regulatory system costs $2.8 billion, sorry, $2.8 billion, and it has a 94% failure rate. Would you want to invest in that? How about ethical access for patients and allowing medical doctors to work directly with 
their patients and choosing drug candidates that are more promising of what's available already. And learning patient to patient, we can iterate more quickly and create better drugs. And the cost? Everybody asks me the cost of gene therapy. Everyone's holding their breath. What does gene therapy cost in medical tourism, the way it is done now? And how can we reduce that cost? This is a comparison between medical tourism and regulated drugs in the US. A regulated drug to treat one eye, if you needed a gene therapy today or you would go blind, is $425,000. And medical tourism, it's between $60,000 and $70,000. That's a lot of money. But you could see how by treating the biggest medical unmet need, biological aging, we can bring these numbers down really quite quickly. And if your child today is born with spinal muscular atrophy, you're looking at a bill between two and five million dollars or they lose their life. Medical tourism is a fraction of the cost. And this is the type of industry that we could actually build on the front end of regulations, helping more patients, getting nonprofits to pay for your treatment, and eventually getting grantors and government to pay for your aging. The stakeholders go anywhere from the patient, the medical doctor, governments, investors, universities, biotech companies, of course, pharmaceutical companies, and you. Because whether you believe it or not, you will be a patient eventually. So you need access to the best medicine in the world. We are working so hard to bring these very expensive therapies down in cost so that everyone can afford them. So insurance companies will pay for them. And you could help us and give me more work to do if you just scan that QR code and you go and sign our petition. This is free to you. This costs you nothing. It creates work for me, so especially if you don't like me, this is a good thing to do. <laughs> And these petitions actually help us engage governments all around the world. Already, we're talking to four different governments, four different options for you when you need it. This is one of my favorite quotes lately. I always get hung up on a quote. I think everyone who knows me knows that. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. We have to let our egos down. We cannot do, we cannot drive for money. We cannot drive to best another company. We need everyone in this room. All of these technologies that you're learning about during this conference are going to be integral in curing aging. So don't silo yourself to one approach. Demand that people work together. Don't let them put their ego before your life. Thank you. And if you're interested in following any one of the three companies, you can do that. Please share our social media. It really does help a lot. It gets new ideas out to new people. And I can't tell you how many times, just from a social share, I've gotten a call from somebody working with a regulatory body. And that is life-changing. Thank you so much.